All right. Hello, everybody. Happy Halloween. Thanks for joining us today. This is our third entry into our five-part educational census webinar series. Today's title is uh, What Motivates or Scares Your Population and How Can You Know? Uh, I'm Kevin Iquinto. I'll be your moderator today. We have another great presentation in store for you. I want to thank you all for attending and staying engaged with us throughout this entire series. Uh, the in-market census period is rapidly approaching, and we hope that this webinar series has aided you in your preparation. Uh, before we get started, I want to go through uh, you know, your, our typical webinar administrative notes. Uh, as attendees, you are in listen-only mode. There are two options to either dial in via phone or use your computer audio. We, um, our speakers will be conducting a Q&A session at the end of this event. So if at any point you do have a question, please click on the question tab in your control panel and we will do our best to get through all the questions uh, for the end of the presentation today. If at any time you need technical support, there is a help tab as well on the control panel, and the webinar is being recorded. So at the conclusion of today's webinar, uh, and sometime within the next 24 hours, you'll receive an email with a link to that recording. And if you have any questions or feedback or suggestions regarding this webinar or this webinar series, feel free to email us at the email address on the screen, marketingops at civisanalytics.com. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I know many of you have been with us for this entire series. Uh, for those of you who don't uh, aren't that familiar with Civis, you will be by the end of the next 30 to 45 minutes, and you will understand why we feel that it's so important that we share our expertise about the 2020 census. So Civis Analytics, we are a data science, technology, and consulting company. We work across uh, multiple sectors, including government, nonprofit, commercial, and political, to help our clients understand the populations they're trying to reach. We empower them through our technology and expertise to create an environment of data-driven decision-making. And with our unique blend of proprietary data, technology, and advisory services, and our team of data scientists, developers, and survey science experts, we can help organizations use statistical proof to guide their decisions and stop guessing. The 2020 census specifically is something we've invested heavily in at Civis. We truly feel that as a country, this is not something that we can afford to screw up. So just by you being here, it reaffirms what we're doing is the right thing, and we thank you for your support and an effort to activate your communities toward a complete and accurate count. Uh, so this, again, as I mentioned, is the third of our five-part webinar series. Uh, webinar number four will open up as soon as this one ends for registration. That'll take place on the 19th of November. Uh, today's speaker, so who's going to be uh, speaking with you? Uh, today mostly will be led by uh, Brian Barron and Ryan McGibbony. Uh, Chris Dick and Jonathan Williams, who you've heard from before, will also be participated in Q&A as necessary. Uh, these, uh, all of my colleagues here on the screen have been very instrumental in our 2020 census efforts. They are experts in using data to identify an audience, target, and message them effectively. Uh, so today's uh, agenda, uh, what we've done here, what you see here is a, really kind of an overview of what we've talked about so far. And the focus of today's webinar will be on understanding the population's attitudes about the census and determining the effective messages to encourage their participation. So without uh, without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Ryan. So um, hang with me for one second while I give him control of the presentation. All right, thank you, Kevin. My name is Ryan. I will be- right, Ryan, Take it away. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'll be uh, I'll be jumping into our first set of uh, main content for the webinar here, uh, which is about measuring attitudes about the census. Uh, we'll talk about what has been measured, what continues uh, to be measured, and uh, why it matters to you, and why you might want, might want to try to do some some more measurement that is more specifically tailored to to your needs and your population, the community that you you care about. So. Why do we want to do this? Why is it important to to measure attitudes about the census? the the uh, The frame that we're looking at all this through is is about understanding self response to the census. So when the census information goes out next spring, asking people to fill out their census forms um, online or on paper or by phone, will they do it? We want to understand ahead of time as best as possible. Um, what can we expect in terms of people's response behavior and 
if we have reason to believe that certain people are less likely to respond, we want to know that we can uh, apply our resources in the in the right ways to try to encourage participation to get the complete count that we all want. So, advancing the slides here. If we're going to talk about attitudes about the census, we have to start with the major research initiatives by the census, census Bureau itself. So the Census Barriers, Attitudes, and Motivators Study, uh, or CBAMS, uh, which is really the uh, main body of research that we can use to, to start to understand this topic. So what is CBAMS? Uh, and if you're already familiar with this, um, that is great. I will be bringing in some, some kind of new newer data points that will help um, to, to build on uh, what we can understand from CBAMS. But what is CBAMS? CBAMS was uh, a couple phases of major research. Um, the first round was leading up to the 2010 census. Um, so that was a study that took place uh, in 2008. This was a large scale survey and a series of focus groups. And there was uh, a corresponding round of CBAMS that took place last year uh, leading up to this 2020 census. Um, this was an even larger survey with um, more than 17,000 survey respondents uh, more than 40 focus groups that were designed to include people with characteristics that are associated with uh, a lower tendency to respond to the census um, to make sure that uh, the Census Bureau could understand the attitudes of those groups in particular because those are the ones that require the, the most outreach to influence their uh, and, and encourage their participation. So we'll be talking about some of some very high level findings from the CBAMS research. Uh, we'll also be pointing out these are snapshot studies. They're, they're very large, complex research studies that have a lot of useful information for, for us as third party organizations who care about getting a complete count in the census. Um, but they are snapshots in time. And um, one, one specific example about why that matters is that the citizenship question that was proposed uh, and subsequently blocked uh, that conversation started uh, while the 2020 CBAM study was was in the field collecting data. So that's not a topic that the the study designers were able to account for and include questions about that topic. So what do we do about that? We can think about follow-up research. Now, the Census Bureau itself conducts uh, tracking surveys to to know what's what's happening with some of these topics that they studied in the in the large studies, but those are mainly for internal purposes. We shouldn't expect to to see data from those, so that doesn't help us necessarily. Pew is a major research organization that conducts a variety of research related to the census. Um, so we'll, I'll mention some some specific um, new research that they've put out. Uh, and lastly, we, Civis Analytics, uh, conduct our own tracking polls on a variety of topics, including um, some exact questions pulled from the CBAMS survey. So um, pulling out key questions in order to track over time, have opinions about these things changed. So to get into what are the topics that CBAMS covers, uh, we talked about trying to understand who is going to respond to the census. Um, Self-response is very important to the Census Bureau because it's really best for everyone if people fill out their census forms, respond to the census. If they don't, um, a lot of a lot of resources needed to be put into following up, uh, sending people out to the addresses where people have not responded. It's very costly and time-consuming. Um, so self-response is, is really what uh, is best for, for the Census Bureau, and it's easier for, for citizens, uh, for, for people in the country uh, citizens and non-citizens, non as we'll be talking about, um, to, to voluntarily respond. The second topic is, is knowledge gaps. Just talking about there are facts about what is the census for, how does it operate, do people understand those things. Thirdly is barriers to response. What are the reasons that people might decide that they're not going to fill out their form? Um, and lastly, taking a more positive spin on it, is understanding motivators. So what are reasons that, that people would be motivated to respond to the census? Uh, and the second portion of our webinar today will go into more detail about how to use uh, the, the insights about what are, what are motivators, but what do you do about them? So getting into the numbers, the, the numbers are showing here, the, the first bar on the left, the light blue, that's the original CBAMS survey, um, looking at people's stated intention to fill out their census form. So 
what we want to call out here is that the stated intention, at least judged by looking at the top two likely to do it categories uh, on the survey question, meaning I definitely will or I probably will, um, which is kind of standard survey analysis practice to say top two likely, that's what we'll say, that's, what, that's our point of comparison. Um, that's 86% looking, looking upcoming to the 2010 census. What actually happened, what was the self-response rate is about 10 percentage points below that. That's the dark blue bar there. So where things start to get more troubling is on the right side, the light blue bar, um, we see uh, roughly the equivalent question. There's, there's a caveat here that these, the survey methodology is a little different. The question wording is slightly different. So um, this is not, not, we cannot directly, directly make uh, this comparison, but it's still important to look at this uh, as a new anchoring point that about two thirds of people say they're, they're likely to respond to the census. So the question we're trying to answer is, what is the self-response rate going to be in the 2020 census? So um, why, why have we seen this drop? There, there is some, there's, there are various research studies that have gone into uh, lack of trust in uh, government institutions, in survey research in some cases. Um, there are various barriers that the CBAMs focus groups have pulled out that might relate to why people are less likely to respond. And as I mentioned, uh, certain, certain things proposed uh, about changes to the census or uh, confusion or misinformation about what the census is all about. So I mentioned that Civis Analytics has been running ongoing research on this topic. Um, this is a look at um, what that research is showing. So again, looking at intent to respond on the left, that's the same number of that uh, CBAMS survey result of, of about two thirds of people saying they're likely to respond extremely or very likely. Um, we've run a series of tracking polls since then. So looking back last year, we actually saw an increase. Um, looking in the most recent months, we've seen maybe a slight decrease uh, in, in people's intent to respond. So this, this, this is concerning, it's, it's important to know about because we need to address, uh, our, we need to plan our resources about how we're going to get, get a complete count knowing that there is some, there's this set of the population that just, just does not intend to self-respond. Um, now I mentioned Pew, I'll, I'll, I'll say here that there was a recent Pew study that was, that was published that, that found a higher intent to respond up, up in, in the 80s. So that, that's another uh, hopefully encouraging data point. It's, it's, a, it's the kind of thing that we need to recognize that, that different polls uh, from different sources can sometimes have different findings and it's important to, to look at them in the aggregate. And uh, it, may, it may actually be that the intent to respond is, is kind of somewhere in the middle range there. But the reason that we conduct these ongoing polls and the reason that we'll continue to collect this data is to see um, what is the mounting evidence and how do, we, how do we draw conclusions from the patterns that we see. So let's, let's move on from intent to respond to talk about knowledge gaps. We've pulled out here uh, a couple of the key questions uh, from CBAMS about uh, factual knowledge about the census. A couple of these where there was relatively low knowledge relates to uh, the topic of citizenship. So the top bar here is uh, the question of, does the census count both citizens and non-citizens? That's true, that is, that is something that the census does um, and about half of the population understands that. Secondly here, does the census uh, is the census used to locate people living in the country without documentation? That's not true. That's not something the census is used to do. Um, and again, about half the population uh, knows that fact. So we again have done some uh, tracking research to include this, the, the same questions from CBAMS. Uh, and we see, uh, again, some differences here. So again, the, the leftmost point on both of these charts is, is the CBAMS result for those questions. And on the right, we see results from our tracking polls. So we see, we see dips in these factual questions and uh, we, we might wonder what, what is the reason for that? And it, we know that there's a lot of kind of confusion and uncertainty in which questions will be on, on the census or not. And uh, what, is, what is the purpose of all this? There, there, um, there are a lot of parties involved in trying to uh, influence people's understanding of what the census is all about. So, this is important to know in particular because this relates to the groups um, that are particularly hard to count for the census. So we, there, there's mounting evidence here that um, it's going to be difficult to get the count out for the, the most vulnerable populations. If we look at the barriers that were found from the CBAMS research, um, I'll, I'll kind of roll through these pretty quickly here. One is concerns about data privacy. So People want to know how is my data going to be used? Is it safe for me to do this? 
And related to that, will there be re repercussions for, for me? Will this be used against me or will the Census Bureau share my data with other organizations who will use it against me? I mentioned just general decreasing trust in government and a government study like this, uh, why should I Why should I do what the government's asking me to do? That's an attitude that's out there as well. Uh, a lack of efficacy, which really means, do people believe that it's going to make a difference? If I respond to the census, does it make a difference? And related to that, uh, are there really any benefits for me personally from doing this? Why should I do it? So what do we do about these things? Again, Brian, in the next section of the presentation here, will be going into how can we, how can we measure um, messages and their effectiveness in overcoming these barriers. And that messaging really needs to be around some of these types of findings about what is going to motivate people to respond to the census. So this again is a question from CBAMS, um, asking people to choose what is the most important reason to respond to fill out a census form. And the top answer here is about funding for my community. Uh, the third most common answer is actually also about community. Um, this is important not only because together this makes up a, uh, a large portion of these responses, uh, about half of respondents say community-based reasons are important, but in particular, we're not showing the, the specific numbers here, but in particular, uh, the, the groups who are less likely to respond to the census are particularly motivated by these community factors. So it's important to understand that as a baseline, and it's important to take this information and, and really adjust it to you and your population that you need to count uh, to understand what are the factors that motivate them. So that was a, an overview of the CBAMS research and some of the research that we've been doing and others have been doing since then to supplement. But we want to mention, if, you, if we use CBAMS as a baseline and we want to build on it and refine the, the, the insights that we can get from it and make sure that they're relevant to, to our particular populations and subgroups that matter to us, um, CBAMS was a massive research project. But surveys and focus groups can be applied in valuable ways on a much smaller scale as well. Um, like I mentioned, this, the, the tracking studies that, that we're doing um, are, are something that's much more lightweight and quick to analyze. They don't require um, a, a, an advanced survey design that takes place, uh, data collection takes place over a period of, of weeks and takes longer to collect and then analyze the data. Um, so, you can be thinking about how you can use these tools for your own purposes to, to, to build on the understanding of existing research and make sure that it's tailored to your purposes. So um, just some quick notes on you know, the difference between focus groups and surveys. Focus groups are great at understanding qualitatively and getting more depth of, uh, of, of an understanding of particular people and what they have to say. They are not as quantitative but they give you, a, they're a great tool for talking to particular subsets of people, given that you can reach those people. So one point here is that um, a great use case for a, for a focus group is working with community leaders who can help recruit the right people uh, from, from your community, for example, who, um, whose, whose attitudes you need to, to dig in deeper and understand better. Um, but we at Civis um, recommend applying both of these tools in complementary ways to get the right insights qualitatively and then quantitatively. So again, I'm, I'm looking forward, um, I, I'm referring here to, to something Brian will talk about in a minute about um, using survey research as a, as a tool to test messages. So we'll get to that in a moment. And, and my last bit of, of a warning here is hopefully I've, I've done something to convince you that, uh, that survey research is important and particularly um, building on existing research and, and doing maybe some custom research of populations that you care about. Um, but there are a lot of things you need to, need to be aware of. One is in the way that questions are asked. Do you, are you asking questions in a way that's going to, to bias people in one way or another? The, the, the particular words that you use, the order of the questions, the way you, you ask them can all influence how people respond, how, the, how they answer the questions, and that obviously has, uh, makes a difference in how we can analyze the results and, and get insights from them. Sampling is an important part of this. Uh, so 
are there biases in how you're sampling? Are you sampling survey respondents in a way that you'll be able to uh, adequately, accurately, uh, and, and in a valid way, project those results to a population? And similarly, are you looking at particular subgroups um, for whom you need to set quotas and make sure you collect a certain, uh, a certain size, uh, sample size of data from that group in order to make statistically valid conclusions from that data? Um, and lastly, after you collect your survey data, you will likely need to apply a weighting scheme to, again, make sure that those results are generalizable to the population that you care about. So these are all topics that uh, are, are easy to ignore if you go and use an online survey tool, for example, and plug in, you know, say, a, a set of email addresses to send to a, a group of people you want to survey. Um, it's important to think about these things, and it's important to, to work with people who have expertise uh, in these things. We have a, a team of, of survey scientists who uh, have deep expertise in applying these techniques uh, in, in adequate and in appropriate ways and have been kind of battle tested in situations where uh, in political polling, for example, you get feedback on who won the election and how accurate were your polls. So we have a lot of uh, experience uh, applying pretty advanced survey methodologies to make sure that we're getting accurate results. Um, so, so I'll leave you with that and I'm going to hand it over to Brian who's going to talk about a, a specific use case for how we can use surveys as a tool to, to understand the effectiveness of messages. Thanks, Ryan. So let's say that you've done a lot of the things that Ryan has recommended. You've looked at the, the CBAM study, um, maybe you've done some of your own research, and you have a, a few different messages that you think are going to be uh, really useful to get out to your uh, target population. Um, you know, it's possible that you're able to use all of those in various marketing materials, but especially if you're paying for a lot of uh, marketing, either on local TV or sending mailers, you might only be able to choose one of those messages. And so the question becomes, you know, which message is going to make the biggest impact? Um, also, there, there are some reasons why you might choose not to use all the messages. Some of the messages could actually cause backlash, which is, you know, discourage people to fill out the census. And that's definitely something that we don't want. So uh, in this section, I'm, I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the general principles that you can use to make sure that you're identifying the, the best messages uh, with scientific rigor. Great. So let's say that we have three messages that we think are going to be useful for our target population. Again, it, uh, as we talked about in the last webinar, the first thing is to establish who your population is at a geographic, demographic, and behavioral level. Um, but let's say we have these three messages about you know, representation matters, um, a message about tax dollar allocations, and another one about you know, how filling out the census is a secure process. And you want to know which of these messages are going to be the most impactful for getting people to fill out the census. And honestly, there's, there's really no way we can really tell what is going to be the most impactful unless we start talking to people, unless we start uh, running experiments. And we want to, again, do this in a very uh, scientific way. So the way that Civis recommends doing this is by using a randomized control trial, or an RCT. And this is you know, really the gold standard for um, doing any sort of message testing, but also running experiments in, in a lot of different fields, such as medicine. The first part of this uh, a setup is that you want to find a representative sample of your target audience who want to take your survey. Um, this is often the hardest part about running a RCT in the real world, because in order to truly do a truly randomized uh, sample, you need to kind of come up with the entire list of people in your population, randomly sample from it, and then kind of force them to take the survey. So that's obviously not very realistic, especially if your population is very large, such as you know all Spanish speakers in Texas. 
um, and th there are different ways to get to something that is not quite random, but is a good proxy for random. Um, so let's say that we've already can get close to a, a random sample. Um, there are lots of statistical techniques that we can apply after the fact to kind of rebalance our survey. Um, after you get that random sample, you want to ask them a few questions. So the first set of questions are what we call pre-screen questions. These are mostly demographic, behavioral, and attitudinal questions. These can also make sure to, if you're doing a survey on the web, to make sure that someone who shouldn't be taking your survey is not taking your survey. You can screen people out during this time frame. The third step is really the most important. Um, this is where each respondent is randomly assigned to uh, a treatment group or a control group. A control group is not actually shown any messages at all. So they are either shown you know, nothing at all and they go on to the next section, or they're shown something that's completely unrelated um, to what you're testing, in this case, the census. So maybe it's a, you know, it's a PSA about recycling or something like that. Um, those who are assigned to treatment groups are assigned only one um, message. And so um, after they fill out the pre-screen questions, they see that message. And so they might see the representation matters message, or they might see the your data is secure message. They will not see both. After you see that message, you can keep it on the screen for maybe five, 10 seconds. Uh, they go on to the last questions, which are the post message questions and the things that we really care about. So in this case, it's going to be, um, you know, how likely are you to fill out the survey, to fill out the census, excuse me. You know, ideally we want to ask this in a way that's consistent with the way the census is going to, um, uh, census has done research in the past, so we can compare our results to other research that has been done. And we want to, again, take those top two results, you know, very likely or somewhat likely to fill out the census. And the random part here is key. The, the random eyes control part is, is really, really key because ideally we don't want any differences between the control groups and the treatment groups except for which um, messages they saw. Ideally, they are uh, balanced on the demographics and the behaviors that we think are going to influence actually uh, filling out the census. And another reason why we really like this format is because you know, randomization is really easy to do in, in a survey format, especially if it's on the web or over the phone. So, you know, it really lends itself well to survey research. Okay, so um, here's some example data. Um, so this is not real results, um, but let's say we um, did an RCT of the of of your target population for these a few different messages, and we found that the group that got the representation matters message, 55% um, said that you know they are very likely or somewhat likely to fill out the census, and that's that's maybe that's pretty good. Um, the you can also look at the other group. Again, these are non-overlapping groups of people, so people did not receive both messages, they only received one. Let's say this group, it's only 49%. And then finally, we can look at the control group as well, and we can say that's 50% you know, of the people. So this control group, again, did not receive any messages. You know, They maybe got a, a PSA about recycling, and uh, they said about 50% of them said, you know, they are very likely or somewhat likely to fill out the census. And so what we can do with this is we can compare the treatment groups to the control groups, uh, control group, excuse me, in order to calculate what the difference is. Um, a really simple calculation, this is an oversimplified example, but you would just take the difference between the percentages. So 55 minus 50 is 5%, and then 40 min minus 50 is negative 1%. So the impact of the representation matters is 5% and the impact of the data security is actually a negative effect. So that might have the possibility of causing backlash. Um, and that's not good because you know, that means that we're kind of undermining our get out the count efforts. And if you did not conduct this type of test, if you just went out into the field with all of these messages, you could have been telling someone a, a bad message and that could have uh, dissuaded them from taking um, the census, which is not what we want. 
And again, this is an oversimplified view. Um, there are a lot of things to consider when you're doing this type of analysis, um, such as how many people were in each group. Um, more people means there's less noise or variance in our estimates. Um, how big is the control group compared to the treatment groups? Um, and then, although the groups were randomly sorted, you know, are are there still maybe some imbalances that are happening uh, by happenstance? So maybe uh, one group has more men than women uh, compared to the control group. Now, there are a few other methods for doing kind of message testing um, besides an RCT, um, but we often find that these have uh, downsides. So the first one I want to talk about is a test retest. Um, this is where an individual is asked their opinion and then shown you know, the message or some sort of creative and then asked their opinion again. So you know, this might seem that it works okay, but the challenge is that this ends up being less accurate because the respondent is easily anchored to their original opinion, making it difficult to, to measure uh, how persuasive the message truly was. And again, this is not the case in, in an RCT because each person is not asked their opinion before, they're only asked it after, um, after they were shown the message or if they were not even shown the message at all if they're in the control group. The second one I want to talk about is self-reported persuadability. Um, this is pretty common in uh, uh, focus groups where you're shown the message and you're asked, well, how persuasive is this message? Do you think this is a good message or not? Um, and then you can often repeat this again with all the other messages. And so if you randomize which messages are shown, you know, it has an element of randomness to it. Um, and it is pretty similar to an RCT. Um, but the challenge here is that uh, this risks measuring the favorability rather than the actual um, per persuasiveness of the ad. Um, so they might say, yeah, it's persuasive because they like the colors or they like the images rather than it's an actual good message to get people out to to uh, fill out the census. Now, this is not to say that randomized controlled trials are perfect. There are uh, lots of uh, barriers. Um, as I mentioned, it can be hard to get a truly random sample of the population, um, and that has a, definitely as a challenge. <coughs> um, but also, um, RCTs, if we want to conduct them uh, via survey, um, they can often uh, cost more money as well, uh, reaching out to um, hundreds or even thousands in your target population. Um, if you're paying them any sort of money, uh, can be uh, can add up quite quickly. So we, we talked a little bit about uh, best practices, and I want to show some research that you know Civis has done uh, that we actually presented briefly in our first webinar, but I want to dive a little more deeply in today. Um, this is you know an actual um, randomized control trial that Civis ran, um, and we had four different messages. So we had kind of the civic duty message, the representation message, um, a status quo message, and also a message about data security. Um, and we use a piece of software called Creative Focus, that which we've developed in-house uh, to analyze the results of this survey. Um, I really like the plots that come out of this. Um, not only do they look nice, um, they have a lot of information contained in kind of a, a small area. So let me walk through uh, kind of what this a plot is showing. So uh, we asked two different questions that we were concerned about. The top one is, you know, how likely are you going to, you know, have your tell your friends to fill out the census? And the bottom one is, how likely are yourself likely to fill out the census? And you can see that the dashed lines for each of those questions are different. The dashed lines here represent a baseline or the control group. So the control groups um, answered them you know, around 65% and, you know, 79% respectively for each of the questions. Um, arrows that point to the right mean that the message had a positive effect and uh, arrows that point to the right, left mean that the messages had a negative effect. So what this uh, result is showing is that most of the messages here had a positive effect and we can safely kind of put them in the field, but the data security one was actually had a negative effect and actually caused backlash in a lot of cases. And so if we went out to the field with this message, um, it's possible that it would have a negative effect and people were less likely to fill out the census than they were before, which is not what we want to do. 
Um, finally, another thing I, I really like about these plots is that they have these error bars around them. Um, whenever you're doing any sort of statistical estimation, um, there's always some uh, amount of variance or noise that comes with that. And it's really important to understand how much noise there is so you can understand you know, which messages are um, uh, the best and also which messages um, are actually significant um, in making a difference. Another great part about uh, the Creative Focus tool is that it allows you to split out the results by different subgroups. So uh, walking through this slide again, uh, we have the two questions, census likelihood and census friends likelihood um, on the left and the right. And the top group now represents um, uh, the subpopulation for Hispanics. So this was done, so the national survey. So um, all the Hispanic respondents are in the, kind of the top and the non-Hispanic respondents are in the bottom. And you can see that the, uh, the dashed lines, the control groups are actually different uh, for each question. They're a little bit closer for the friends uh, question than the census likelihood. So this is telling us that, you know, at a baseline, without even showing any messages at all, Hispanics have a lower likelihood to fill out the census uh, compared to non-Hispanics. Then you can look at the different arrows and see which messages made an impact and which messages did not. Um, we see largely the same trends that we did at the aggregate level, that uh, the data security message is overall not good and the um, the other messages are generally better um, but we do see a little bit of difference in in the um, among the different subgroups here and you can imagine a scenario where um, maybe one message is positive for one group but for the other group um, it's negative and so it's really important to study these uh, breakouts because it allows you to understand you know, for which groups are the messages best and which groups you should maybe avoid certain messages because it's going to cause backlash. Um, you can apply this type of methodology, not just for the census, but for a variety of different fields as well. Um, let's say you're testing a political ad or um, an ad for, you know, um, a, a company, um, maybe an ad for the Super Bowl, something like that. You can use this type of research in a, in a similar way. So this is the last slide uh, that I have. Um, and after this, we'll open it up for questions. But just want to give a kind of a quick summary. You know, in today's webinar, you know, we, we talked about different ways to measure opinions using pre-existing research and also conducting research yourself. And then once you've done that, identifying which message is going to be the best suited for your population. Um, the overall techniques I think we've shared are pretty simple, but there are some pretty nuanced ways um, to enhance your results. And, you know, if you're not careful, you could be making uh, an improper decision um, that could um, cause backlash um, for your get out the count efforts, which is something we don't want. Um, I really like the image on the right because it kind of shows that you know once you make these insights and once you collect the data you know you're going to have to make decisions on them and then the whole cycle repeats again so these are tools that you're not just going to use once ideally you refine them and you continue to use them um, that might be a little less applicable in terms of the census because the census you know is kind of going to come and go but in terms of just if you know interacting with your target populations whether that's consumers or community members um, being able to um, get feedback and analyze it in a smart way is a, a really powerful tool. Um, hopefully we've given you a lot of tools that will help you in your uh, census endeavors. And I think now we're gonna open up to questions. All right, thanks Brian. So we do have a couple questions that came in, but before we get there, I uh, wanna say thanks to Brian and Ryan for uh, the content they provided during the webinar today. Also wanna Congratulate them on not doing any Halloween puns <laughs> and sparing our audience uh, on this special Halloween day. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and go through some of the questions that we have. Uh, the first one is about um, just the concept of, of custom research for your population and how do I know whether or not I need custom research for my population? I think Ryan's going to go ahead and take this one. Sure. So I would say... 
as as a first step, if you have not taken a deep dive into the CBAMS uh, published research report, that's that's a good starting point to to start to look at what are all the different ways um, that that they design that survey to be able to slice up and look at different subgroups and different different subsets of the population. Uh, and and for your own purposes, be thinking about how relevant are the subgroups that they've identified to uh, your populations and segments of your population. Uh, I think it's useful in some cases to kind of have, have a broad strokes view of, uh, for example, um, a, a, a racial or ethnic group and how they might think about the census. Um, but sometimes that is, that's too blunt for the nuances of the actual variation in, in, uh, in how people think. So um, I, I would start there thinking about how similar is your population to, to the types of populations that have been covered in this research. Um, and if there are any significant um, departures from that that you're aware of, that's where I would consider finding a way to do some custom research. And, and, and that custom research doesn't necessarily need to be brand new um, designed survey. You know, I mentioned some of the tracking research that we do um, or, and kind of the lighter weight um, injecting new questions into ongoing kind of tracking polls. Uh, that it, it's possible potentially to, to utilize some existing research that, that we, for example, have done and um, apply a different kind of weighting methodology or weighting scheme to, to make those results um, be more, um, more relevant to the, to the types of people that, that you care about. Uh, but with that in mind, there, there are limitations um, if you're talking about uh, a population that is uh, very hard to, to reach. Uh, if they're hard to count, it makes them harder to survey as well. So um, there are limitations to, to how, how specific of a, of a group that we, we can reach with survey research. But we'd be happy to talk through those details with you. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Uh, so the next question comes in and it's about, uh, regarding going back to the CBAMs uh, from our first part of the presentation, the question is, are you using the same mode for the follow-up tracking surveys as the CBAM? Hey, this is Brian. So great question. Um, so we use a different sampling frame. Um, CBAMS is connected by the Census Bureau, and I believe they use a combination of uh, ABS or address-based sampling, um, in addition to uh, some focus groups, um, where CIVIS primarily we use web panels uh, to conduct a lot of our survey research. Um, you know, we've as as Ryan mentioned, you know, we um, have a lot of experience using these web panels to make um, informed decisions around um, polling decisions and helping um, companies with, with their surveys. And, you know, we think that although there are disadvantages of using web panels, um, we think that all, uh, the benefits outweigh uh, the cons and, you know, our weighting methodology can help um, make those web panels a little more representative as well. Excellent. Uh, okay, so the we have a couple more questions that came in. The next one is, how would I know whether I need custom research for my population? All right, so I think I think we covered that one. Uh, but another one that I saw uh, was Ryan, you want to take this one? Hi there. So I think I think I, I covered that one. But I, I see another one here. Uh, about how do I know what what messages I should test? So if if you're going to do a message test survey, how, how do you know what messages to put in there? Um, Brian, I, I'd invite you to to jump in here too. But I I think uh, one challenging thing about looking through these examples is uh, do 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 you want to test variations of the same message uh, versus do you want to test um, kind of differently themed messages? And I think each of those approaches kind of has different pros and cons. I think what Brian walked through was um, taking some of the different potential barriers and testing a message from each one. Um, if you're very confident that you know the barrier you want to address and you, you, you need a more nuanced view of, of how to phrase it or what angle to take on it, that might be a reason to, to kind of narrow the set of messages that, that you're testing. Um, but coming up with those messages is really something that, um, you know, might be the job of a, a creative agency or um, just really people who are who have specialized expertise in designing that messaging that you're going to test. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I agree, I'll agree with all your points. Um, another key thing I would say is really understanding, you know, if you are, you know, a 
a CBO, a, a community-based uh, organization, really trying to do focus groups to understand, you know, along with the research that's been done by the Census Bureau, understanding which of those messages um, are the biggest concerns. Um, the again, the the census did the Census Bureau conducted the CBAM survey back in 2018. So things have changed in the last two years, and understanding um, what has changed in that time is really important. So trying to do some sort of focus groups, um, but then after the focus groups, um, being able to kind of test the effectiveness using kind of more large scale initiatives, such as a web panel survey or um, a truly random control survey um, is really important. Okay, great. Uh, so just one final thing. So we have a follow up to one of our previous questions where um, our attendee was interested in the weighting techniques that since a lot of the groups that we may be targeting have low technology usage or uh, they may present a problem with sampling them, uh, if you could talk a little bit about the weighting techniques and uh, Jonathan Williams is here to kind of give us the answer to that question. Hi, thanks, Kevin. Uh, and hello all, since I have not spoken yet. Um, yeah, so there's this good question about uh, one, of the, one of the known sort of weaknesses or deficiencies with web-based uh, panels is that they don't reach out to groups who have low technological use, sort of that's inherent to the form, right? Uh, but that's one advantage that survey research has over something as sort of um, mechanical as, as pure enumeration, like the, civis, like the census tries to do itself, that we can try to reweight uh, to not necessarily wait to create more low technology users because we may not have any low technology users in our sample, but we will have people who share some of the same opinions or some of the same traits and characteristics as those who don't have good or reliable internet connections. Uh, we've done some research on our end of making sure that when we take a web-based sample that we can weight it to a population which includes non-web users. Uh, this is never going to be a perfect process and it's always going to be an evolving process, but it's something we're certainly thinking about around the uh, 2020 census in particular because you could replace um, folks without broadband internet access for example with several other hard to count groups that would be unlikely to be reached through a web panel not because they lack internet access but because they may have different barriers to completing a survey um, one example would be some uh, uh, populations with physical disabilities or those needing care or etc so Again, an evolving topic. Uh, in some cases, the key is not to try to find those exact individuals themselves, but to understand them, to know their preferences, their attitudes, their motivators, and weight your sample towards the folks who do respond, who share those motivators and attitudes and characteristics. All right, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, so that's uh, that's our last question that we have here. So that's going to conclude our webinar for today. I did want to let everyone in attendance know that we do now have uh, registration open for webinar number four, which will uh, be the final webinar before census actually hits the market in 2020. So this one will be about how to implement your campaigns, taking everything that we've learned over the previous three and actually putting it into implementation. So that will take place on November 19th. You can visit our website to register for that. I want to again thank uh, Brian, Ryan, and Jonathan for today's presentation, and thank all of you for attending. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. If you have questions uh, about the census or, or any of the census products or software that we've talked about today, feel free to reach out to us at one of the email addresses below. Uh, with that, again, thanks again for your time, and we hope you have a wonderful day.